Amen. As you're being seated, let me also invite you to join me in the book of Philippians in the first chapter. We've come in our church in the past couple of weeks to the beginning of a journey through this great epistle of the Apostle Paul to the church. And so today, in light of what we've already experienced and committed ourselves in and to, we come to verses 12 and following of the text. It's text that is, my hope, will become increasingly familiar to you. Uh, text that perhaps even already is familiar to you, that the increase of the familiarity of it would be that it, it continues to give application into your life and your desire to want to honor and to follow the Lord in all of your ways. So in this, in this letter that Paul has written to the church in Philippi, it is, again, a church that the Apostle has a dear affection for. He has great love for this dear church. And he shares with them in these verses, and these, again, are verses that, if you've gathered with us in the past, these are verses we've even read and made observations of and application of portions of them. Today, my intent will be to, uh, to, to reapply or give redirection, not not to, in changing of any of that, but seeing more in the, in the depth of what Paul has to say concerning primarily to this issue of how do we exalt the Lord? How do we worship the Lord? If you've never asked the question, what does worship really look like in my life? I want you to know up front that it is my desire from the text here today that you see and you, you'll learn and they maybe have a better understanding, maybe an increased understanding. Not to, not to imply that you don't know what worship is or that you don't know how to worship, but that it would increase in the understanding of it. It is a strange and perplexing thing that the word worship is so rarely used by the Apostle Paul. It doesn't mean that it's not a significant matter. He gives instructions concerning how the church ought to gather themselves together. He gives exhortations that they ought to gather together for purposes of worship. But very little instruction on how to worship the Lord. In Philippians chapter 1, he actually gives some instruction to us. And so, it would be to our advantage that we stop along the way and we, and we ask the question, well, how do we worship the Lord? And then let the Word of God give instruction to how we worship the Lord. There is a great danger in our world. There's a great danger in the modern church that we, we think we know how to worship God without consulting God. And so we begin to invent ways to worship God. We begin to design methodologies and systematic systems of what we think feels good for us and giving no consideration whatsoever to the Word of God. Recently, I've been in, in dialogue with an individual in our community who makes argument that, we, that God doesn't need us, that Christians, let me get this correct, that Christians don't need to consult the Bible to know who God is. Can I say to you today, if, if you're thinking like this, you are in perhaps one of the most dangerous thinking philosophies of the age to think that you can know who God is without consulting the Bible. You are in grave dan danger of following and pursuing another God. If you do not give serious weight and enormous consideration, all consideration, to what God would say to us in the how and the who and the what we are to do. So with that, let me read the text, verses 12 and following. He says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorium guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also with good will. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. 
The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, uh, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether in life or by death. Verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Well, God, we ask that you would take these words of yours that you've inspired your servant, the Apostle Paul, with, and he recorded, and the church has through the ages preserved it and handed it down to us that we might know you and that we might know what you want from us. And oh, dear God, may it be of benefit to these who have gathered here today, to all of us who have ears to hear, to hear what the Spirit says to the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let me, let me at least start here. In verse 16, Paul says that there, in verse 15 and 16, Paul says there are two, two basic groups of people who are handling the gospel in the day. There are those who are doing it in selfish ambitions. They're doing it for profit. They're doing it for their own advancement, whether it be politically uh, culturally, and to do so, they're having, they're having to readjust some other things to be considered acceptable in the general culture. So in, in these, there, th those are some who are proclaiming the gospel. And my, by, my, my, by my saying proclaiming, I'm saying they have taken on themselves and they have declared the name of Christ. They've made some form of a proclamation that they are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps that's like everyone that's here today. Everyone making at least some level of a claim to the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul's saying, now out of those who make claim to the name of Christ, there are two essential groups that are in this. One of those are those who have done so out of selfish ambitions or, as he would later argue, in vain, in conceit, in, in arrogance, in pride. And then there are others who have taken on the name of Christ and they've done so in complete understanding of the Gospel. They understand completely that apart from the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are, they are wretched condemned to hell and deserve all of God's wrath. So there are those who make claim to the name of Christ and perhaps today maybe the most important question for you to answer is which of those do you fall in? Those who have made claim to the name of Christ and the use of God's name, the use of Christ's name, you've completely blasphemed His name and you're using it always in the wrong ways and in the wrong means. And then the rest that God would give us humility to see that the name and the use of the name of Christ is that Christ will be glorified because He's chosen to put the name of His Son upon a, such a wretched sinner as I and you. So this gospel is Paul's greatest interest there is, there, of all the things that concerns Paul, there is nothing that concerns him any more than the advancement of the gospel. The gospel being, man are, men are sinners, condemned and just to be, to be rightly condemned of the, by the wrath of God. And the gospel meaning there is good news that God sees the condition of men and God knows there's only one way for men to be saved and that's through the, through the blood of my only begotten Son. And so I give my Son to them that they might be redeemed, that they might be saved, that they might be delivered. We've seen this in previous weeks. Those are all statements that bring with them pre-assumed 
conditions to them. If, if God is our deliverer, that means we are a people who need to be delivered. If He's our redeemer, we're the kind of people that need to be redeemed. If He's our Savior, we're the kind of people that need to be saved. This is, this is the Gospel making proclamations about every person present and everyone living or past, present, or in the future of every soul of men in need to hear this good news. And so this is of greatest interest for Paul. The Gospel always of great consideration for him. So he makes these types of arguments. There are, there are those, and he's telling the church in Philippi, listen, you should be concerned about everyone who takes on the name of Christ, but do not get all tied up in a knot that there are some who are misusing the name of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that the church doesn't have a responsibility to point them out or to point the problem out. Paul has a lot to say about this in his letters to the churches. But here, he's encouraging the church in Philippi, don't think this an undoing thing for the sake of the Gospel. God is big enough to handle the Gospel. He can handle people who make false claims to the name of my Son, and God can handle that. He's telling the church in Philippi, let your focus be like a laser. Focus completely in on this proclamation work of the gospel. Now, let me make fast way to verse 19, 20, and 21. And I may need to use verses 22 and 23 as well, but let's at least make way to verse 19. If you still have a copy of God's Word open in front of you, let your eyes fall on verse 19. Paul says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. So we have to stop for just a minute and ask the question, what, Paul? What's going to turn out for your deliverance? Well, we already know that he's meaning, in part, the suffering that he's experiencing. The difficulty. Paul's imprisoned. He's chained to Roman soldiers in a Roman jail system in the city of Rome while he's writing this letter to the church in Philippi. And so in his suffering, he's even then, even that moment, recognizing and encouraging the church, this is okay. This is going to turn out for my deliverance. Now he'll get to what he means by that in just a moment in the, in the completeness of it. But don't be worried about my hardships. Don't let my hardships, don't let my suffering, don't let my difficulty consume you with worry and fret. This difficult situation that I am, God is going to use it for my deliverance through, notice he's going to say two things. One of them is very peculiar. He's going to do it through your prayers. and The other is not at all peculiar. He's going to do it through the provisions of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now the reason I call the first peculiar is because of this. What power do I have in directing God to do anything by any prayer that I offer to Him? If God is a sovereign God, you understand the complexity of this. You almost begin to understand that there is conflict with this, but we're going to be good students of the Word of God and we're going to be listeners to what God is saying to us. We're, we've already prayed and we've asked God that we might hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches but there's nothing we have to hear today that isn't rooted and, and the foundation found in the Word of God that He's already delivered for us. And so what is, this, what is this matter of prayer? Well, to not, be, to not belabor the issue for too long because we have other, other messages in the journey through Philippians to focus more upon prayer, but we certainly can't read that and then just make a quick moment and pass on to it. But let's at least understand this. What an enormous opportunity that God has given to the church. This isn't, this isn't a responsibility that God has given to unbelievers for the prayer of the advancement of the gospel. This is something He has uniquely given to the church. Did you hear that, church? God has given you the unique responsibility to pray for the advancement of the gospel. That's one of your duties. Now, now, how engaged are you in that duty, in that responsibility? Well, Paul's saying, 
In this hardship of the advancing of the work of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul's saying, I'm convinced that this is, this is how I'm going to be delivered from this, and it's going to be through your prayers, and secondly, which is the primary, through the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. God's working, God's power, is not in words that man can say to God to persuade God to do anything outside of His will or His sovereign design of life, but it is that the Holy Spirit is working in the hearts of men, specifically the church, the local church, and in our community there are multiple congregations who I believe desire to do this, this being one of them. That the Spirit of God would actually work through His church and the means in which God has designed for His advancing work of the gospel is that His church be a praying people. Well, we'll have more to say of this in coming journeys through the text and we'll come back to verse 19 to see the fruit of what Paul will say and make argue of this in the coming, in coming weeks. In verse 20, he says this in continuation. So from the prayers and the provisions of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether in life or by death. Now Paul says something in verse 19 about this deliverance. And then in verse 20, he speaks with confidence that there is going to be some type of deliverance from his current, as he would argue to the church in Corinth, these momentary and light afflictions, these hardships of his life. There's going to be deliverance from them. Now Paul's, Paul's clear about this. There's no mistaking what Paul's meaning. He is satisfied and he is convinced that whether, he, yeah, whether he's ever freed from chains in this life or not, there is deliverance on the horizon for him. Deliverance of a greater bondage than just the chains of men. Deliverance from the chains of sin. Deliverance from the bondage of the flesh. There is a deliverance that is for certain, which obviously and quickly makes its connection to the gospel. Man's greatest condition is not relief from momentary, temporary, light afflictions, as Paul would make argument of this. By the way, this morning in my Sunday school class that I attend, taught by Dan Steinecke, I'm thinking... I think Dan can preach this message from Matthew chapter 7 better than I can. It is a good argument. So I'm, I'm making a plea for me. You ought to get yourself engaged in a Bible study class. You learn the depth of these things. You have opportunity face-to-face -face dialogue and understanding and meaning of this. But get this. Paul's making observations. If you know anything about Paul, he suffered enormously in this world. And most of his suffering comes after he commits himself to the obedience of the gospel proclamation to the ends of the earth. Hardship after hardship. Difficulty after difficulty. Not just emotional. Not just spiritual. But physical difficulties. Sickness. Tra or train wreck. He didn't have trains. <laughs> what well, Shipwreck. All kinds of physical hardships, beatings, multiple times at near death beatings for the gospel. And he's saying this while chained to Roman soldiers, confident of his deliverance. What? Of temporary, momentary, light afflictions? No. Deliverance from this bondage, Romans 7 and 8, this enormous, ongoing, life, never ceasing battle between my spirit and the flesh. That God will liberate me and deliver me from this as I give and devote everything to Him. 
And the strength is going to come to him from the work of the Holy Spirit as the church engages herself in prayer. He speaks of worship in this. Now, now did you pick it up? Did you see it at all? What a, what a peculiar place that Paul would actually use one of his few times that he would actually speak about worship. Packed in the middle of of, of just prior to one of the most popular phrases in the book of Philippians. Now you, you get verse 21. Matter of fact, it's possible you've even got this on a plaque somewhere in your home. Verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, what, what does that mean? It sounds good. We know it's in the Bible, so it, 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 it is good and it's, and it's a powerful statement. But do we really know what that means? Do we really understand how we can do this? How, how for me to live as Christ and to die is gain? What is that at all? We can't understand that unless we know what Paul's meaning in verse number, number 20. At the very end of verse 20, he says, in, in his proclamation of, this, of the deliverance, the, his earnest expectation and his hope that this is going to happen, and that in doing so, there will be no shame. Again, not in this world, but in the days to come, in, in eternity, that there will, he will not be the recipient of shame, but that with all boldness, now here comes the last part of verse number 20, Christ will even now, that word now, you cannot miss it, you cannot separate it out of anything that Paul's saying. If you, if you discount what he's saying now, it doesn't make sense what he says about anything else. If you don't capture this moment in time, that word now is a word declaring a moment in time. It's happening now. This isn't something, this, 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 he is talking about deliverance from these in a day to come, but there's something happening now as well. With all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, another marker of time, he's, what he's doing now, he always does. He doesn't do it now for certain people, for certain times, for special circumstances. What God is doing now, He's always doing. In church, we must not forget that. Your circumstances, if, if you drive your life driven by the circumstances of your life, you'll, you'll never be satisfied. You'll never have true, lasting joy and pleasure in God. Think about it. Some of you right now are going through some of the most difficult days of all of your life. And you're saying, where is the joy in this? If you don't think that God can give joy now, based on the fact that He's always able to do it, then you'll think lesser of God that He's not capable of bringing joy now. This is a consistency. This is the way God does it. He will even do it now, as always. And how is He going to do this? Through the worship of His worshipers. I need to say that again. He's going to do that through the worship of His worshipers. Now, some taken on the name of Christ and they've, they've plastered Him on, his, on their lives and they've used His name in vain using Him as in vain conceit and in all kinds of selfishness. They are not worshiping God. They're worshiping themselves. Now they've given, it, they've given their worship of themselves a more spiritual title because they know they've been to church long enough they've been around church folk long enough and, 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 and heard preachers speak it enough in their lives that worship of self is idolatry. And so let's just give what I do a good church title. And let's say, let's call it worshiping God, but let's not change anything about what I'm doing. Let me just define it in my own terms. Let me define what worship of God looks like the way I like to worship Him. You're not exalting. You're not worshiping God in that moment. You're, you're showing who your God is. 
And you're declaring your worship to Him by your selfish behavior and your prideful arrogance. But Paul understands this in the humility of what God has done in light of the gospel. And it's something that God is doing now, and it's something God has always been doing. And that is that in my life, whether I'm living or whether I'm dying, that Christ be worshipped. That God be exalted. That God be lifted up. Now think, think of this, church, that he, Paul is saying that where Christ will even now and always be exalted in my body. So whether I'm delivered from these chains of men or not, now, right now, while in chains, I will worship the Lord. If God chooses to deliver me from these chains of men, in that moment, I will worship the Lord. In that moment of time, in that moment of, of breathing, the breath that man has to ha ha that man has, what is he doing with his breath? What is he doing with his steps? Think of it, you've been redeemed by the by the creator of the universe from the just judgment upon you. And he's given his holy name to you and he's put his righteous son's blood over you and declared you holy. And look at us. We have breath to worship him. And what do we do? We use our breath to complain of the hardship we're in right now. Because we're not willing to see that what God is doing right now is something God is always doing. Because we've taken our focus off of God and we've put them upon ourselves in our own circumstances, in our own situation. That even in this hardship, I will worship God. That's what Paul's saying. Is there, is there any benefit in that for you? Is there any benefit... In that for me. Paul says, whether, in, whether by life or by death, I will worship God. Everything about me I'm committed to, I'm devoted to. That, it, that I will be delivered through the prayers of the saints and the provision of the Holy Spirit according to my earnest and greatest expectation and all hope that I have in the work of Jesus Christ that I will not be put to shame on that great day of judgment because... I've not gone there on my account. I've gone there on Christ's account. So I can go there rejoicing now in my hardship. Now lest you be confused, hardship doesn't mean my deliberate sin. Hardship means because I'm devoted to Christ, because I'm obeying Christ, because I'm worshiping Christ, I'm still suffering hardships in my life that even in that circumstances I will not let the circumstance keep me from worshiping God because I deserve hell and look what God has given me he's given me sonship to the king of kings so why Paul can say I will worship in my body he's saying he'll say it to the church in Rome this is an actual living sacrifice my my breath my words my attitude my my body my life my, my whatever my hands find to do wherever my feet take me whatever my eyes fix upon whatever i allow to come into my ears everything about me is a living sacrifice unto who unto god is what paul's arguing for but we need to ask the serious questions who am i offering these sacrifices to am i offering them to god or Am I offering to them to a thing that I've called God, which is really to satisfy my own selfish, sinful, wretched cravings that are opposed to God? This is Paul's great plead to the church. That Christ be exalted. He be worshipped in my body. Think of it. Think of how many people are in this room right now. How many all the different, uniquely, individually specific things of our lives. 
whether in my body, whether in life or in death, think of the different stages of life that some of us are in. We've, you saw before you, now none of us know the, the number of our days. You saw in front of you earlier this morning, brand new life. And if you look around the room, you'll see some that are quite advanced in years. Whether in life or in death, regardless of the situation, regardless of the stage of life that I'm in, in life and in death, everything that I'm going through is a moment for me to speak or to lift worship and praises unto my God. This is Paul's great plea to the church. Now what does this look like? Well, Christ, if I'm doing so, if I'm committing everything about me unto the Lord, this means that Christ is exalted in my dying However that will happen, whenever that will come about, Christ is exalted in my dying by the way I'm living right now. Now, now capture that, church. What you're doing right now is establishing a moment for worship to God when you're dying or when you die. What, what are you doing right now that's that in your living moments, in your, in your youthfulness, in your strength, in your own philosophy of life, in what you're doing now, you are saying in your death, that's the God I worshipped. And if that's true, the other is true as well. Christ is exalted in my living by the way I die. So at the end of days, or at the at that moment where death comes, maybe it'd be sudden, maybe it'd be lingering, maybe it'd be hardship, maybe it'd be through disease of years and years of hardships in this world. But in that dying, the way I treat God in that moment shows in my living, breathing moments who I'm worshiping. Whether by life or by death, Christ be exalted. Now, to put it into simpler terms, perhaps, Christ is shown in us when my neighbors see me getting out of my car. I think, Paul, that's so silly. Everyone gets out of their car, and everyone goes into their house from their car. But is it in this moment, as in always, does that mean when I'm getting out of my car? Or is it just in moments that are really special moments? Is it not in every moment now, as in always, that Christ be exalted? Then would it not, by argument's sake alone, include when you get out of your car and your neighbor's watching you? That's a moment to put Christ on display. It, it is the moment, by the way, church, to do that. Oh, you say, well, Paul, what a silly, what a silly example. How, how can, is that really, literally, worshiping God by my getting out of my car and going into my house? And I'm carrying these, I'm carrying all these groceries and I'm, ti I'm, I'm tired from a full day of work. I'm going here. I'm, I've got marital problems. God, how's that? How's that moment going to glorify you when my neighbors are watching me get out of my car? You're weary from all of the hardships at the workplace. And your neighbors are watching you. And they're observing you. Now, at some point you're saying, well, Paul, am I putting on a show for my neighbors? No. Paul says, now, as in always, regardless of who's watching, I'm worshiping God. And would it not be a benefit that an observer would watch a worshiper of God walk from his car to his house? How, would he do it any different way? Would he do it without, would he do it in any other manner? I don't, I don't know how you get out of your car at your house. I don't, I don't know what that looks like. But could it be a moment where the glory of God could be on display? Now, you're not preaching the gospel. Let me just help you think for a minute. You're not preaching the gospel when you open your car door, and you gather up all your groceries, and you walk into your house. You're not preaching the gospel to anyone when you do that. 
Preaching of the gospel, according to the word of God, has to be with words. It, it can be, if actions aren't matching the words, there's a problem in it. And yes, there's good argument that your actions are support of what you proclaim, but the gospel must always have words. It can never not have words. Not if we're going to be a people of the book. People of what the Bible instructs us and tells us about how this gospel gets advanced. But think of this. Your moments of getting out of your car and your neighbors are watching you. They know you. They're observing you. They know by the way you walk from your car to your house who your God is. What about when you're at the checkout at the grocery store? You've run that credit card and it's rejected. The way you're going to act at that moment is a moment for worship of God to be on display by other people of how worshipers of God respond. That's, that's pretty embarrassing. I get it. Nobody hates that moment. The debit card, the credit card, the library card, nothing works. What are you going to do? Now, as in always, is it not include that moment? Or does it just include the moment from about 10.30 to, oh, it's definitely not going to be noon today, but in this ballpark time of timeline, is that the only time when I'm going to put the glory of God on display and worship Him? Paul says, now as in always. Even in those moments. What about when I'm disciplining my children? Parents, your children must be disciplined. Do not think that your, one of your blessed duties that God has given to you is to not discipline your children. Don't go down that crazy road. But realize this, when you discipline your children, you are putting God on display. They're watching you. They're hearing you. What about when I'm posting things on my social media outlets? Some of you are going, I have no idea what you're talking about. Don't know what Instagram is. You don't know what Twitter is. You don't know what Snapchat and you don't know what, so, what, what Facebook is. And listen, if you don't, probably your life's better off if you don't ever find those things out. But is it not a moment, church? Proclaimers of the name of Jesus Christ is not what you're about to click, put there a moment to either put you on display or the gospel on display. Now, that doesn't mean that everything you post must be a scripture verse, must be a verse, must be this. Everything, now and always. Things that you're excited about, things that, are, that you're sad about, things that you're expressing of your emotion. They are saying to a watching people who are watching worshipers of God. And they're seeing you more in love with this world than with God. And they think that's what worship of God looks like. What about when you're lying in a hospital bed dying or your spouse is on the verge of her last breath? Now as in always, may the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ be preeminent upon my mind and give me reason to worship God in my body, whether in life or in death. What about when I'm depressed or when I'm angry? What about when I'm playing? What about whenever I'm preaching or when I'm teaching? What about when I'm on the clock at work or I'm at home by myself and no one else is looking and seeing what I'm doing? What about when I'm praying and what I'm praying for? What about when I'm singing or when I'm reading or when I'm writing? Or what about when an opportunity arises for me to cheat on my income taxes? Or what about a moment where you're invited to a private getaway 
What about in a moment whenever you, you have a, a thought in a second that crosses your mind and I can, I can do whatever I'm doing and nobody else will know? Even then, see, is it now and always or is it just in peculiar special circumstances? Paul says it is now as is, as in always. May Christ be exalted. May he be lifted up. And may anyone who knows anything about me know he is my God. There's that statement in verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul's literally saying, whether I live. So let me put a couple of parentheses in here. In chains or free. Whether I live or die, may Christ be exalted. May He be worshipped. For me to live, whether in chains or free, for me to live is Christ. So in, all, in this moment and in all moments, may Christ be lifted up. For me to live is Christ. If I have breath to live, if I have breath to breathe, may it be giving worship unto God. In my conversation, in the way I'm thinking, all of that's included. It doesn't have to be, okay, wait a minute, I've got to worship God. I wasn't worshiping God then. We've already talked about it. We've already established a case for that. When you're getting out of your car and you're going into your house, when you're at the checkout line, when you're, when you're anywhere, doing anything, are all moments of expressions of worship. And you're saying to anyone and everyone who's watching you who your God is. Paul's saying, for me to live, I have breath to breathe, I, it's all Christ. It's committed to Him. I get Christ. I'm, I belong to Christ. In my living, I'm Christ. That's good. I can handle this moment right now because I got Christ. And listen, if I die, <laughs> that's okay because I get Christ. So if I live, I get Christ. If I die, I get Christ. Believer, you can't lose. You get Christ. Christ. 